All right, hello everybody. This is Search and Seizure in Golf Balls, where I will teach you a little bit about search and seizure, and then Eric will tell you everything you want to know about not hitting someone with a golf ball and getting blamed for it. <laughs> I don't, oh, can I have a quick show of hands? Who knows a little bit about Eric's story or has heard it before? Oh, okay. Fair amount of people. If anyone else is confused after we're done talking, talk to one of the people who just raised their hands. They'll explain. All right. My name is Jim. I am a criminal defense attorney. I've been practicing here in Vegas for the past three years or so. Eric is but a modest hacker <laughs> and was minding his own business one day about two years ago when he found himself arrested by the Seattle Police Department. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to talk a little bit about search and seizure law, when the police can stop you, when you can be searched, what the law actually is, and then we're going to see from Eric's experience how the law is actually applied by the police. And you might see a little bit of a difference between the two. <laughs> and we want to have time for questions at the end. Hopefully we will have time to have questions in here. If we don't have time in here, we'll be in the Q&A room over there. 113, thank you, after this. Okay, oh yeah, I have to give my legal disclaimer. Because I'm a lawyer, I have a legal disclaimer, which is that you should not take legal advice from some guy talking at DEF CON. If you actually get arrested, <laughs> hire a lawyer or get the public defender or whatever, but don't take my advice as the gospel truth. I only have 20 minutes to instruct you on law that took me at least three or four months of law school to learn. <laughs> so I'm not really going to cover everything, okay? And don't try to play gotcha with me either. I know I'm leaving stuff out, okay? <laughs> I speak from experience with hackers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, search and seizure law is mostly based on the federal constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. This is stuff that they really should have taught us all in high school. Instead of telling us about the bill on Capitol Hill, they probably should have told us what to do when police stop you and when police can stop you because, honestly, that's the interaction most of us have with the police or the government more often than passing bills and you know, the executive branch and blah, blah, blah. However, they don't teach us this stuff in high school, so that's why I'm going to give a little primer, give you a little framework to understand what happened to Eric. So there's basically three different levels of when the police can stop you. There's the voluntary stop, investigatory detention, also known as the Terry stop, and getting arrested. And that's going from, you know, least serious to most serious. All right, so the first one is the voluntary stop. And that's a fancy legal lawyer way of saying the police officer says, hey, can I talk to you? And you say, sure, why not? Ta-da, you've had a voluntary encounter with a police officer. This is when both of you are agreeing together to have a conversation. Or at least that's the way it's framed. The officer's going to say you're both agreeing that you're having a conversation. Maybe you're kind of a little bit intimidated into having a conversation. Now, this can last as long as either one of you want it to. Um, and there's completely obviously legitimate reasons to talk to the police officer. It's not all you might get in trouble. You know, everyone's had a situation where they actually call the police and want the police to help them. So it's, it basically lasts until you've both decided to stop talking to one another. And the way you know it's a voluntary encounter versus something more serious that we'll get to is that you are free to leave at any time if it's a voluntary encounter. If you ask the police officer, hey, you know, I, I'm basically, I'm done talking. Is it okay if I leave? I have some place to go. If they say no, then you're being detained. You've been seized by the police officer. This almost isn't a seizure, but officers can use a lot of tricks to keep you kind of intimidated where you'd like to say, I want to leave or, you know, I'm kind of done with the conversation. But, you know, they're a police officer. They have shiny badges and uniforms and guns and things. So they might try to tell you you can stick around, that you should stick around. But you have a right to walk away from a conversation if all it is is a voluntary encounter. And my advice to you is to be polite to the police officer. Be helpful if you want to be helpful. You don't have to be. But at least be polite. Uh, don't turn on full asshole mode at the beginning. If, if you're walking by and the cop asks you what time it is, don't be like, oh, am I free to leave, officer? Are you detaining me? <laughs> Just be cool with the officer. And, you know, they're, they're people doing their jobs too, all right? They might have a... Uh, a different outlook on some things than you or I do, but they're doing their jobs and they might be having a bad day. Just play it cool and hopefully you won't escalate to the next level of a police encounter, which is an investigatory detention, which is also known as a Terry stop for the famous case Terry v. Ohio. 
which says the police can stop you when they have reasonable suspicion that a crime has occurred and that you're somehow involved. And as you'll hear from Eric, this is pretty much the situation when they first showed up on the scene in his case, arguably. I saw you're about to argue with me, don't. <laughs> All right. And basically, the cops get a call. Um, in Eric's case, it was these guys are screwing around with golf balls and they hit somebody and they show up and at this point they're investigating whether a crime has occurred. They don't really know. I mean someone calls 911 but you know they don't know if a crime actually occurred, if it was a prank call, if it's something serious, not serious. They don't know what's going on. So they're showing up and trying to figure out is there a crime, is that guy involved in the crime, what's going on. So they're allowed to hold the person there until the suspicion is confirmed or the suspicion is evaporated or dissipates or whatever fancy word you want to use. Dispelled, sure. That was geeky. <laughs> All right. Um, so they can stay there and basically they investigate and if they decide after some investigation that they got the wrong guy, they're supposed to let the person go. At that point it goes back down to the previous level of the voluntary encounter. I mean if they're letting you go, you, you can stick around if you really wanted to um, or you can leave. Or it gets escalated to the next level which is you got arrested because they confirmed the suspicion that there was a crime. So this is a kind of in between place and because of that your rights during this time are pretty unclear. Um, you always have your rights, we'll talk about later, the Miranda rights, like to remain silent, to have a lawyer, you always have those rights, those are constitutional rights. But it's not really clear if you have any special rights, they don't have to remind you of them at this point, they don't have to read you your rights at this point because they're just investigating. It's also unclear how long they can keep you in this kind of twilight zone of investigating but not charging you with anything, not arresting you. Um, the courts take it on a case by case basis, they can't, I think, it's usually like if you go past an hour or two of standing on the side of a road, the courts are kind of like, yeah, they should probably let you go. Or they should, you know, they can always come find you later if they need to. There's also a question when they're investigating whether or not you have to identify yourself to police. And this is especially true in Eric's case, which is why he's here to talk today. Um, the answer to that is it depends what state you live in. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case called Hibble that was out of Nevada. Nevada has what's called a stop and identify law which says if you're being stopped and investigated by police for some crime, you do have to identify yourself. And the Supreme Court said that law is fine but it's up to the states. So here in Nevada, if they're investigating something and ask you to identify yourself, you do have to identify yourself. In Washington state where Eric was detained, there is no such law. And he'll talk about what will happen because of that. But <laughs> uh, there is no such law there. If there's about 15 states that have stop and identify laws, you can Wikipedia it later. I don't have a list in front of me, but you have to check on whatever state you're in as to whether you have to identify yourself to police. When you get stopped in this way, w before you get arrested, so you're not arrested, you're stopped by the side of the road, they can only pat you down for weapons if they have a reasonable suspicion or idea that you have some kind of weapon on you. They don't just get to search you if they've stopped you like this. Um, they can search you only for weapons, only if they have some suspicion that you have a weapon. Maybe the 911 caller says, oh, I thought he had a gun. Well, then they can pat you down. But they can only pat you down to make sure you do or don't have weapons. They're not allowed to go into your pockets. They are not allowed to feel something and say, oh, that feels like a wallet. I wonder what's in there. Let's take that out. No. They basically get to feel you up. If it feels like you have a gun or a knife, they can take that off of you, but that's it. They don't get to search anything else. They don't get to look inside things. Nothing like that. Um, they can always ask you on this level or the previous on a voluntary encounter, they can ask you for permission. If you want to let the officer search you, you can, of course. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> and uh, this of course leads to many police reports where they claim that the person let them voluntarily search. Um, whether or not that actually happens is in question many times, but you have a right to not be searched basically up until this point. And again, b this level is very vague. This investigatory detention is very vague about your rights and what you should do. Again, just remain polite, remain cool and calm um, as you'll see Eric doing for the most part <laughs> throughout his encounter. And try not to get arrested. <laughs> Which leads us, oh, come on, open office. There we go. <laughs> what was that? What's a weapon? It's something that can be plainly identified as a weapon. So if you have some crazy like ray gun or something, then probably, 
if it feels like a gun, then they get to take it away. If it feels like a knife, they probably get to take it away. Something you can hurt people with. Uh, that's getting a little ridiculous. <laughs> um, they could probably like, if you have a big ass hammer just hanging off your belt, they probably yes could like just put it over on the side for a little while. Um, stuff like that. All right. Yes, yes. All right. It's not lawyer gotcha time. Let me continue. <laughs> you can annoy me about what's a weapon during the Q and A. All right. Level three is arrest. They get to arrest you if they have a warrant for your arrest. Big shocker. If they actually see you committing the crime, then they get to arrest you, of course. And if there's probable cause that a crime has occurred. Do not ask me to define probable cause. That will take too long. And I will be here all day. Probable cause is more than reasonable suspicion. Excuse me. If they show up, let's say, to a scene, now one caller says, oh my gosh, there's a bank robbery. A guy with a black t-shirt and camouflage shorts just robbed the bank. They show up and I'm still standing around and ten people from the bank says, that's the guy right there. Obviously the police didn't see me commit the crime, but at that point they have probable cause because ten people are all pointing at me and saying he robbed the bank. Whether or not I actually robbed the bank is the question for the trial, which is way down the road. Right now we're just dealing with the police. So basically once you get arrested, they get to keep you as long as, they've, as, long as they want to. Um, you have to be charged within a certain amount of time. That's a different thing. And they basically get to keep you until you're charged with a crime, not charged with a crime. And if you're charged with a crime, then bail has to be set, etc. You do get to be searched when you're arrested. And that's a full on search. Your pockets are going to get emptied. Um, they're going to take an inventory of everything to make sure nothing gets stolen or you don't accuse them of stealing anything, right? All right. And, the <laughs> and uh, if you're driving your car when you get arrested, there's many, many rules about what part of your car gets to be searched. I'm going to say the short version is if you get arrested while you're driving your car, yes, they can search your whole car. So if you're carrying around your weed in your car, bad idea. <laughs> they will find it if you get arrested. Um, they also obviously get to search you and they get to search anything within basically your, your arms reach around you. They get to search if you're arrested in your house. What are your rights at this point? It's your Miranda rights and I'll go into more detail in just a second. And I'll just do it right now. And then uh, my advice of course is for you to shut up. But there's a caveat to that. Once you're arrested, you have these rights. The right to remain silent and the right to an attorney. And the other ones in parentheses are special. Um, if you're a kid under 18, you have the right to have your parent present in any questioning. And if you're not a US citizen, you have a right to someone from your home country's embassy or consulate come you have a right to have them come help you, come talk to you. But anyway, the main two are the right to remain silent and the right to an attorney. So this year, the Supreme Court decided one of their stupidest criminal decisions in a long time. Because previously, the way you exercised your right to remain silent was you were silent. And that makes a lot of sense. If the police are talking to you and you're sitting there not saying anything, and they keep talking to you, keep talking to you, you're not saying anything, you're quiet, well, clearly the person's choosing to remain silent. They're exercising their rights. And the point of that is at some point the police need to stop asking you questions, stop being intimidating, let you remain silent because that is your right and leave you alone. What the Supreme Court said this year, I don't remember the case name, but they said this year, in order to exercise your right to remain silent, you must tell the police officer that you want to be silent. <laughs> so. What you have to do is once you get arrested, you must say, I want to re remain silent and then remain silent. <laughs> and then that will work. And then they have to leave you alone and not question you about what's going on. You also have the right to an attorney and you, should ha you have to say, I want to talk to my attorney or I want to see an attorney and then stop talking. If you put any qualifiers on it like I probably want to see an attorney, I think I should see an attorney, it's a good idea, it doesn't count. There's many, many cases on this. It doesn't count if you put any kind of qualifying language. All you have to say is, I must see my attorney or I want to see my attorney, the end. So you have to actively invoke your rights. There's no more passive uh, courts assuming that you want to exercise your rights. You actually have to step up and invoke your rights. So if you ever get arrested, please step up and invoke your rights. Um, they're there for a reason. They're there to protect you. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. So now that's the basic framework, the three different ways the police can stop you. And as you'll see, uh, Eric's experience was we kind of start out 
where they're investigating the crime, and he ends up in jail. Whether or not he should have is... Well, currently being uh, debated. <laughs> so. Still, two years later. Yeah. Just All a right. moment while I steal the video uh -huh. here. <laughs> Brand new laptop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, in the meantime, they, he got arrested because he and a bunch of people, some of whom are here in the audience, I don't know if they want to hide or say who they are, a bunch of people were playing what's called urban golf in Seattle. How come I don't know? Is your laptop? There we go. <laughs> oh, because oh, oh, it's dual view. Oh. So if you could tell us what urban golf is really quick. So yeah, urban golf. Uh, Divide, are you in the room? No. Oh, son of a bitch. Um, it's organized in Seattle by this dude, Divide, and uh, pretty much the deal is it's, um, it's a prearranged, organized event open to the public. It kicks off here, uh, various different locations, but that was Cal Anderson Park, uh, Capitol Hill neighborhood. Anyway. Um, what the organizers do in advance is they go around and they put little uh, AstroTurf uh, greens out on various street corners around the neighborhood and you tee off from each of these greens and you play through you know alleys and sidewalks and parking lots uh, to little holes that have been uh, set up in advance and uh, it just so happens that each hole is uh, approximate to a drinking establishment. And so by the ninth hole, uh, you know, which incidentally is where the incident took place, um, it's, uh, you know, it's been a fairly lively uh, and engaging uh, experience. So yeah, it's, it's a great time. Um, yeah, go for it. By the way, how are we for time? We're fine for time. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I might want to be long-winded, though. Yeah, no, that's okay. All right, so I have a little setup here. Now's the time I'm going to hit a golf ball into the audience. If you don't want to get hit by a golf ball, move. They're foam. They're not going to hurt you. Nerf ball, by the way, just like in the real event. Yes, yeah, so we're recreating the real event. Uh, for some reason, we were listed as a demo on the website. So I decided I should do a demo. So. <laughs> if you want to get me arrested, you got to try harder than that. I'm kind of debating how much, uh, you know, how much I want to uh, ramble about all this. So how, how are we for time? Ramble. Okay, ramble. So I'll start, I'm actually, I'll tell the story in flashback format. And I'll start with at the point that I got arrested uh, and then I'll circle back to how it all went down. So at the point in time where the officer decided to arrest me, you know, did the predictable thing, put me in cuffs, sits me down on the curb, does his thing for a while. Eventually he throws me in the back of a squad car. There were a bunch of squad cars on the scene. Uh, he turns the little in-car video camera that was facing out the front of the car to face me in the back of the car to record me ba behaving badly if I should have chosen to do so. And uh, probably also to provide evidence that he wasn't, you know, beating me up in the squad car. I don't know. Um, hauled me off to the precinct house. When we got to the precinct house, you know, they made me stand with my feet, you know, my toes on a little line of black tape while they took my picture. And uh, oh, I forgot to mention also they did search me incident to the arrest when they first uh, put me in cuffs. Uh, search incident to arrest, um, you know, he basically he turns your pockets inside out. Uh, I remember, you know, when I finally found myself in the holding cell at the station, I'm sitting there uh, still in cuffs with uh, my pockets turned inside out and, it, you know, just noticing a yeah, little camera on the ceiling in the holding cell and uh, this big metal, gnarly metal hook embedded in the cement floor. I'm like, wow, how do you get yourself attached to that? <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, um, having been, uh, you know, participating in urban golf earlier, I'd, you know, I'd been consuming liquids and, you know, I, I still had a fair amount of liquids on board and it was getting fairly uncomfortable and I was waging this private battle with the police. This, 
I was not going to ask, ask to use the bathroom and thereby give them the satisfaction of confirming that maybe I had, in fact, had a couple of drinks. Uh, but, you know, so it was, you know, at a certain point I start to wonder, like, how long do you ha hang on to me here? You know, they're like, uh, am I going to have to use my phone call to have somebody feed my cat? You know, what's going on? It, it wasn't too traumatic. They threatened to hold me over the entire weekend, but that turned out to be a bluff. They cut me loose after about 45 minutes and, uh, you know, much later I was charged, and I think if there's time, I'll ramble about that as well. But uh, yeah, so circling back to the incident itself, um, I think I'll just roll the tape. <laughs> so, oh, you know what, actually, I had a rant for a second before I roll the tape. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the police, by the way, when I went and asked for the tape during my criminal trial, produced no tape. Uh, after the tr case was dismissed, um, I filed some Public Records Act requests for the tape. I was told, oh, well, we had a tape, but we erased the tape. I thought that would have been a violation of uh, SPD policy since I'd read the policies at that point. And uh, so then I did some research. Turns out that the system they use creates activity logs for all the tapes. So I was like, wow, I, I want to see who erased it and when. So I got the activity log. Turns out they had the tape the whole entire time. So this is that tape. They just forgot, right? <laughs> So I'll ramble during the first minute of the tape about the technical aspects of p digital in-car video systems used by the police. Uh, here the cop car is just parked because the police have been interviewing the complainant, that is the person who called 911 because he got hit with a Nerf ball. And uh, <laughs> at a certain point they see a bunch of golfers at the other end of the block and the complainant goes, look, golfers. And so two of the cops jump back in their squad cars and turn their squad cars around and go and, you know, uh, initiate the contact. And that's what's happening here. Officer Emily is turning her car around. And uh, there's the bar that was the ninth bar in the course. And uh, the complainant's here in white sneakers. And uh, there's another cop standing there. He's going to walk over in a minute. This, this is silent because this is the camera's in so-called pre-event mode. It uh, continuously records everything that goes on, but only when it's activated does it start to retain uh, the video. And so it gets the 60 seconds before it's activated by the officer turning on the overhead lights as the one up front does. Also notice how they park at an angle. That's to get the best possible view for the camera right through the windshield and all that good stuff. And we'll get audio now because uh, <laughs> Officer Emily has just turned on the microphone that has... What's your head over there? That's yeah, yeah, no, no, no worries. Keep walking there. No, sure, sure, sure. Are you with them? Are you with them? I'm not, I'm not giving you any statements. That is not what I asked you, though. I said, are you with them? And I'm not giving you any statements. Are you with them, yes or no? What is that about a statement? Yeah. Well, to answer your question, that would be a statement. I'm not answering hey, questions. Where did they have to go to? He's not giving any statements, though. So. What's that? He's not giving any statements, though. So. Now, I don't know if you can hear what he just said, but that cop just walks right up to her. She says, he's not answering any questions. And he says, cool, that means we get to arrest him and hold him for the weekend. He looks at his watch and says, that's it, you're not going to see a judge until Monday. And all I've done is not answer questions. Can he do that? Oh, um, yes. Uh, can he actually arrest you for that? No, not in Washington where there's no stop and identify law. And besides, you're just minding your own business and they want to ask you simple questions. So you can refuse to answer. Um, can he threaten to arrest you and, you know, take your firstborn child and all that kind of stuff? Yes, he, the police officer is allowed to lie to you and generally intimidate you into saying things, but you also have a right to resist that. So, wow, that's, I mean, that's pretty brutal. Like, so if I assert my rights, he can totally just, like, threaten to violate them left, right, and center as a, as a way to maybe well, get, get me to waive them. Well, he, yeah. up to a point. I mean, if he takes out his gun and points it at you and threatens you, yeah, yeah he's crossed the line. But <laughs> can, okay. uh, can he just be, can he be generally mean to you to make you, to try to trick you in answering questions? Yes, he can. Okay, well, continuing. Thank you. Run around with the call. So, uh, yeah, we don't really have the audio of my conversation with the officer here because the girl with the mic, she's walked away. The audio and video recorded, man. Would that help you deal with this? So. Hey, if you put your hands in your pockets one more time, I get to search you. Really? No. <laughs> um, the police's favorite words are furtive movements, which basically means anything they want it to mean, and they try to turn that into a way to search you, because they're like, oh, he kept edging his hand toward his pocket, so maybe he has a weapon there. That's why he's doing it, right? Instead of just, 
you know, someone's really nervous because they got pulled over by a cop, so they're fidgeting. So, but no, obviously, uh, at this point, you're not under arrest for anything. There's been no claim you have a weapon other than a, maybe a golf club, which you're not holding. And uh, <laughs> he has no reason to search you, so no, he can't search you right now. Okay. That's now on so, video. You know, for so the next no minute or two, I'll just let that. the tape roll, and uh, some interesting so things happen you? in a minute. But, She just called me a joker. <laughs> you are. <laughs> so, I guess it bears mentioning while she's elsewhere with the microphone that uh, during my conversation with the officer here, I was careful to ask, am I being detained? He's like, yeah. I was like, so I'm not free to go. And he's like, no. He's like, well, why? And he's like, we're investigating an assault. And this is the first I'd heard of any assault, but you know, in, in my mind's eye, I'm like, Great, somebody drunk with a golf club just totally went to town. Oh, can you pause for a second? <laughs> so. This is also the usual, the police getting the law half right because they're cops. They think they know the law 100% and they're usually half right. Someone got hit with a golf ball is a battery, not an assault, <laughs> genius. Um, but getting hit by any object, by a person like, okay, I'm gonna point you. That's a battery and you can get arrested for that technically. Um, hitting any other person against their will with any object is a crime. And so they have a right to investigate that. And Why don't you address intent? Because, I mean, the guy who hit the dude with the foam golf ball didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> we believe. Um, that gets into technical legal jargon, but basically... I suppose he didn't technically, he didn't intend to hit the guy, but uh, he's at least civilly liable for hitting the guy. And, <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, civil um, liability. Civil liability, yeah, it's a pain. And then, <laughs> um, he's probably still criminally liable. I mean, if you're, hit, if you're hitting golf balls in downtown Seattle, what do you, you think someone's not going to get hit once in a while? We want to be very careful, by the way, to say nerf balls or toy nerf, balls. Nerf golf not balls, of course. Golf balls. So. Sorry. Yeah. Does the guy have to show they were injured? No. You do not have to show you are injured for there to be a battery. Like, literally, this is a battery. I'm not joking. Stop. Sorry. Stay <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. yes, put, all right? Hand. Red hand. Right now they're just screwing around with me, but in a minute they're going to start trying to figure out what to do about this whole situation because they're kind of befuddled themselves. I didn't think you said that. I'm just you know. making a comment the, uh, on my observation of your behavior. Also, uh, a character's about to enter from camera right. right. That'll be the complainant, again, in the white sneakers. And he's going to be tipping them off to the fact that he just saw... Was one of them... Are any of the ones the ones that you're... you know which one... Pretty sure. A little bit thicker, like my eye, a cat. Oh. So the complainant just, you know, they said, so do you know which one hit you? And the complainant's like, he's a bit thicker, like my height with a stocking cap. Also notice I'm right there. So this is legally relevant because, uh, well, well, should, should they still be detaining me at this point? No, because he just showed up and said, that's not the guy that hit me. <laughs> um, they asked... I, or they, he didn't exactly say that, but they asked, who's the one to hit you? And you're standing right in front of his face, and he didn't point at you and say, yeah, that's him. So really, at this point, they should probably let you go. And also, hmm, does this have some, is this possibly the reason why this tape went missing for a year or so? <laughs> we can only speculate. I don't know. So. Well, I yelled at another guy. Oh, well. So, So anyway, the, the police, they're now conferring yeah. among do, themselves. Do we, have we got him to be able to identify? He doesn't have his glasses. He doesn't have his he glasses, he says. They don't even have an ID on their suspect. And, um, yeah. We'll give, them another, we we'll give the tape another few seconds to roll before I cut it. So, actually, no. So, yeah, instead of turning me loose, what do they do? They decide to gather up the IDs of everybody on the scene. Uh, including people who couldn't possibly be the assailant because they're the wrong gender, wrong race, <laughs> just everything. Do you want to help me collect them? Do you have ID on you? 
Yeah. Got that yeah. information there. Okay. Can you see your ID? Alright, every single one of you. Go ahead and take your ID out of your pocket now. If you have the legal basis and authority to remove my ID from my pocket, I will not remove I do have legal basis, so go ahead. I don't know if everybody could hear that. <laughs> he asked me to take my ID out, and I kind of thought about it for a second, like, how do I answer this? You know, because he already threatened to throw me in jail for the weekend, and so I'm kind of like, I'm very nervous. I, this, you know, I'm like, this guy, is like, I'm, I'm walking this fine line, like, I want to assert my rights here and, and not be pushed around or, or, you know, have him messing with me, but at the same time, uh, you know, now he's getting really assertive with me. And uh, so I said, well, if you have the legal basis and authority to remove my ID from my wallet, I will not resist. So, of course, you know, a, a, little, a little overwrought of an answer, and I wouldn't... I was going to say, I don't know if you want to bust out the legalese every time. Uh, you might just want to be like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, so. yeah. Now, a, a reminder to something uh, Jim said earlier, don't try this in the state of Nevada or no. any of the 23 other states that have stop and identify laws where, provided that the officer has reasonable suspicion, which this which, one doesn't, yeah. with respect to me anyway. Not now. They could have done uh, it earlier. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyhow. I will not remove you. You have to remove it. Go ahead and remove no, your ID. I refuse to remove where, where is your ID? This is so good for camera. I love it. I love it. You said it's great for the camera. I love it. Turn around. Put your hands behind your back. Back your hands together. Which pocket? The left one. The other one. I know. Do you have anything else on you I need to know about? No. Okay. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Is it in a wallet or something, or is it free? Um, I've been giving you a lot of statements these last couple of seconds. I'm stop There's your wallet. Go ahead and remove your ID from it. I can't take the wallet. It's got money in it. You're going to accuse me of stealing it. So remove your ID from your wallet. Thank you. So. So yeah, despite the fact that the camera's rolling, he's got, you know, his colleague standing right freaking there, you know, also despite the fact that he had no qualms about searching the incident to the arrest five minutes later, um, he's now telling me that I need to search myself for him, otherwise I'll accuse him of stealing stuff from me. Well, the <laughs> no, he... <laughs> One wonders. That, yeah. yeah, well, again, this is the cop half knowing the law, because he knows that, okay, if he's not under arrest yet, I can't actually go into his pocket, so I'm gonna ask him to do it for me. But at the same time, he's like feeling up your pocket and stuff, which he's not supposed to do anyway, because he doesn't think you have a weapon. So again, he kind of half knows what's going on, but eh, not really. Yeah. <laughs> so. I will arrest you for obstructing if you don't. You know, we, you we, we, not. we, we can, we can play this game as spot. much as you can. I am making I a, am legal, you a, a, a legal uh, request of you to remove your, your ID from your wallet. I have removed your wallet from your pocket for your request. I'm not going to dig into your wallet because I'm not comfortable with that given your demeanor. Now, if you don't want to remove your ID from your wallet, I will take that as a refusal to identify yourself. You are now informed of that. It's on a recording, too. So if you refuse to give me your ID, which is now in your pocket, if you refuse to give me your ID, then we will arrest you. Don't talk to right now. You're sorry. Yeah, okay. Go back over there with them right now. I'm requesting your ID. Give me your ID. Do you refuse to give me your ID? Hey, we can always take it down, and you can go to the right. fingerprint right. section. Yeah, that's all she wrote. Wow. Yeah, so we found another one. The, uh, uh, I'm the organizer of ID. So what were you eventually charged with, exactly? Yeah, so I'm just going to let the tape run with the volume turned down now. So, yeah, the aftermath here is they, um, they charged me with obstructing, which is really broadly written law. I'm not going to play the lawyer with a lawyer actually sitting here, but I happen to know the Washington State Obstruction Statute by heart as a result of this experience, and that is I don't, so. any willful act where, which has the effect of hindering, interfering with, or delaying an officer in the discharge of his or her official duties is a misdemeanor. And so, you know, to read that statute at face value, it's almost like you don't have rights. It's almost like, you know, refuse to answer questions, that's a hindrance. Don't let them search your car, that's a delay. And that's exactly how the police department will, you know, likes to interpret these statutes. And they have obstructing statutes like this in a lot of states. And, you know, to a great degree, it's, it's like Jim says, you know, the cops, they kind of half know the law. You know, they're not, they don't have the entire, uh, you know, American court system in their brains to sit there and untangle these conflicting statutes that have these inconvenient rights that kind of, you know, 
work at alter, you know at different purposes. Right, so. and that's I mean that's not their jobs, but unfortunately it can have some really bad side effects. Obviously, like Eric went to jail for how long were you in jail for? I was only in, I was only held for about two hours. Oh, okay, but I mean you could have been in there. I mean who cares? I wouldn't want to be in jail for two hours. I wouldn't want to be in jail it for a couple minutes. Up your Friday night, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and I mean you're did you bail yourself out or did they release you? They released me. Hey, so at least they're nice enough to do that. But I mean, a lot of people can't get released. A lot of people can't afford to bail out. And, you know, it's not their job to know exactly what the law is. That's my job. It's the court's job. It's other people's jobs. But it can take several months of sitting in jail before you go to a trial or have a hearing that decides what the law is and what, whether what you were doing was right or wrong. So that takes a long time and it's a pain in the ass. And so it would be nice if the police were a little more informed on the law instead of just construing everything in their favor. Funny you put it that way. Oh. So, about informing the police of the law, I guess it, since there's time, sure. uh, I'll talk a little bit about the aftermath of the experience. So the first thing I did is I went home and I located the Washington State case that uh, cleared up the ambiguity of the situation all the way back in 1982. Uh, Washington State Supreme Court, uh, in a case called State v. White, said that, quote, a detainee's refusal to disclose his name, address, and other information cannot be the basis of an arrest. And so I took the case citation and I emailed it to the Seattle Police Department's Office of Professional Accountability uh, 10 days after the incident and said, hey, you guys have tape, you've got the facts, here's the law, uh, don't be arresting people for this. And uh, the Seattle Police Department took my opinion into due consideration and decided uh, to go ahead and charge me with the crime of obstructing. So they're like, who cares what the law says? You're <laughs> Um, and that's when the situation got really, really actually kind of frightening. Um, because, you know, at, at the time of my arrest, emotionally I was, I was okay. You know, I'm kind of like, all right, well, it, this is a fun little civics experiment, isn't it? You know, sitting in handcuffs, riding around in the cop car, fairly comfortable in the knowledge that I'm innocent. Um, except that then when it's time to actually review the facts and the law, the system started to go sideways on me, and now I'm like, oh my god, I'm actually being charged with a crime. This is now on my record. They almost didn't let me into Canada when I tried to go up for CANSEC. Um, they, you know, then of course there was the whole thing of like, you know, crap, what if I'm convicted? There goes my career. They, they offered me a, uh, a deal. They would drop the charges if I did a bunch of community service. Um, and well, I was going to say, other people were arrested that night too. You weren't the only one who was arrested. Yeah. There so, were two other people, right? Yes. Uh, I'll come back. You know, so yeah, also. Let's go, let's go down that road for a second. So yeah, two other people were arrest, arrested. One more for obstructing. Uh, that was a totally bogus arrest as well. Allegedly, the guy walked away from an officer after being ordered to stop, despite the fact that they'd already arrested somebody else for the assault. Um, and that somebody else who they arrested for the assault uh, was not, as the complainant described, a bit thicker about his height wearing a stocking cap and white. Um, <laughs> that, so uh, actually... Uh, do you mind being singled out? Where are you, dude? <laughs> it's uh, the real killer. So, <laughs> no, actually, I was actually talking. Oh, there oh, he is. Sorry. Yeah, here's here's Hikari, who had the extreme Hi, unpleasant Hikari. experience of being arrested for assault with a Nerf ball. <laughs> he also got charged, and I'm sure it wasn't any more fun for him than it was for me. Um, his case was dismissed as well when basically the half dozen people who were with him the whole entire time informed his lawyer that pff, we didn't see a damn thing. And anyway, it was a Nerf ball. So <laughs> at that point, the city decided to drop his case. Um, city, did, city pressed my case all the way to the brink of trial. Um, we told the city attorney's office repeatedly about the law and they just kept ignoring it and ignoring it and ignoring it until finally the morning of the first contested hearing, which is when you actually go and get in front of a judge and argue something. And that's when the city attorney said, just kidding, dropping the case. <laughs> I was out like, hmm? But I said, but you didn't drop the case. They dropped the case. Yes. <laughs> so at that point I was out several thousand dollars for my attorney's fees. And so my attitude at the time about the, 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 decision to exercise my civil rights was a somewhat doubtful one. You know, I was like, well, that was a very expensive learning experience. Um, but like I said, later on, I asked for the tape. I started thinking about suing the cops. Uh, I am suing the cops for false arrest and various other claims. That case, eh, it's, it's, it's going. I actually, um, I guess it bears mentioning, just, uh, just this week settled a related case for their failure to turn over the tapes. Um, and the experience at this point has been 
educational and expensive for them. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think on, uh, on that note, I guess now's about the time to turn it over to questions. And well, before we do that, do you want to hit a golf ball to the audience? I yeah. I think you All should. Right. All right, here. <laughs> this time he won't get in any trouble for hitting the golf ball. <laughs> All right, heads up, fools. <laughs> you got to watch the back swing, by the way. Just, I'm actually surprised. I'm looking at one. No. <laughs> you don't need to go to court again. Oh, come on. Get up like a man. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Where is it? It's, it's under the stage, man. It's under the stage. It doesn't put your back into oh, it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly it wasn't him. My green. Uh, heads up. Who got it? Come on down. <laughs> don't have any more, so don't ask. <laughs> Five minutes for questions. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Come. Oh, sorry. It's not your turn, Junk. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, though. Ah, uh, that is true. The question was: Are you required to provide identification? if there's a stop and identify law or identify yourself. Um, there's no requirement in the U.S. except Arizona for you to carry your papers on you. <laughs> so you have to identify yourself. Give them probably your name and your birth date. Um, if you lie, you will be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. it, it, that is a crime at that point. So don't try to do shenanigans if they ask you. If they have a right to ask you, you need to tell them the truth. Oh, all right, so the, the short version of the question is, <laughs> if a cop approaches you to ask you a question, should you just say nothing, or should you say I'm exercising my right not to talk to you? I would just say, um, somewhere in between, I would say, you know, politely say, you know, I, I, I'm not going to answer a question, I have somewhere else to be, I'm, I'm walking away, see you later. If he wants to stop you and es try to escalate it at that point, then he's probably going to have some explaining to do, um, depending on the state. All right, junk is going to die if we don't answer the question. Then <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Yes. All right. So the, the question is. <laughs> the question is if, if you. No, because in Nevada there's a law that you have to post the trespass notice on the place first. So yes, if you if you manage to f accidentally go on the roof of the Riviera, they can kick you off the property. <laughs> Right, right. I'm just saying, hypothetically, um, they can oh. certainly eject you from the property because they don't have to let you be here, but no, that's not trespassing. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay, let's go with the yellow shirt and then the gray shirt. Thanks. So if I'm taken at some point into an interrogation room, is there some golden time limit that I uh, have to have last them on Oh. Um, question is, if you're in an interrogation room, you've been arrested at that point, is there some golden time limit before they have to stop questioning you? 
The answer is no, not really. However, the longer it takes, the more likely a court's going to say that's not cool and kick out whatever they get. Um, at some point, hopefully, you evoke your right to be silent or to have an attorney, and that should end it sooner. But uh, no, if you hold out for 24 hours, um, it's not like there's some magic limit where they have to stop questioning you. Do they have to give you water and bathroom? I, I'm sure at some point, yes, the answer is that. But OK, before we go to the well, person great, in the gray shirt, we've gray just been told that time is up, and we need to continue right. this discussion in room 113. Oh. <laughs> All right, great shirt. Oh. All right, thank you, everybody.